At this point, I would not summarize everything we have done. We might have other opportunities to do that. But I hope you uh, are able to find your way through all these many, many steps. Uh, we hope that the proof is now in a form where each individual element or each individual subsection of the lecture can be understood. It, everything builds, of course, on the previous steps, but I hope that everything is explained um, in a conclusive way, step by step. But now we have reached the end of all our steps. All our formalism has now proven to be valuable. Uh, probably we have used almost all the abbreviations that we ever introduced. And now we are at the end, and we have completed the induction. All graphs become finite. All counter terms can be uh, absorbed in Lagrangians. The Lagrangians are local. And uh, therefore, our renormalization procedure in the end defines a viable quantum field theory in line with all the postulates of quantum field theory. Remember, there was a remark uh, at the beginning of the section 3.5 on this which we have not dealt with, but uh, nevertheless, this finishes the central theorem. And dimensional regularization is one way to carry out the renormalization procedure. You have intermediate steps where the divergencies exist in form of one over epsilon poles. And uh, at the end of the day, the poles cancel, and you can take the limit epsilon going to zero and obtain the finite result, which doesn't depend anymore on the regularization procedure that you have used. It is only true that we have chosen a particular renormalization scheme, the so-called minimal subtraction scheme, which is very common, at least in its modified form, MS bar, which is, however, for this proof, absolutely identical. It only gives a different meaning to what we call mu tilde, and that is why I used mu tilde instead of mu. It's just a rescaled mu, then you have MS bar. So this is a specific renormalization scheme for fixing the finite parts of the counter terms. And uh, that scheme is implemented in dimensional regularization. However, that does not mean that the final physics result um, is specific to the chosen regularization. You can switch to any other uh, renormalization scheme by adding finite counter terms, and you can do that uh, from any starting point. Also, if you use a different regularization, you can add finite counter terms to get to MS bar and vice versa. From here, you can get to any other renormalization scheme which is consistent to fix the finite parts of all the counter terms. But uh, here in this particular lecture and in particular in this section, we are not really discussing renormalization schemes at all. You know they are important, uh, actually, very important part of renormalization theory but not the part we are dealing with right now. Now we are dealing with finiteness and we have achieved finiteness and this is a very important fundamental result. And I would now like to end with some comments. Just to write down some comments on the proof and on uh, the result that we have obtained. The first important comment is what I already mentioned, namely on the counter terms. As a byproduct, the proof has shown that the counter terms are local and uh, unique and independent of um, uh, the embedding of the counter terms. So let's write this down. The proof shows and gives a construction of counter terms minus T R bar of H for a sector. 
we have explicitly shown that they are local and uh, polynomials in a certain degree, uh, degree of divergence of the respective graph. Let's not write down the details, uh, but you know in which degree it is. And it contains up to 1 over epsilon to the n. This is uh, now a corollary of this proof, but of course this is actually part of our full theorem that we stated at the beginning of section 3.5. So uh, it was not part of the induction proof uh, or induction hypothesis, but it comes out of this now as a byproduct. Uh, but this is actually an extremely important statement for the full fundamental theorem. And so this gives a contribution for uh, the full counter term Lagrangian, then a sum over all graphs and all sectors. So for the, if we fix one graph, then first of all we need to sum over all sectors and for each sector the result holds and there is a finite number of sectors. So overall this result is true for a full graph. And uh, then uh, the full counter term Lagrangian is then a sum over all possible uh, divergent structures, which means we need to sum over all graphs which have a, a degree of divergence bigger or equal than zero. Another byproduct of the proof was actually on the mu dependence, which is also interesting. So the mu dependence appeared at one place uh, where the danger uh, arose that the mu appears together with divergences 1 over epsilon. From one loop examples we know that this does not happen, but here we now see explicitly that at the multi-loop level it also does not happen. So explicitly the even 1 over epsilon to the power L times um, mu to some power uh, cancels and what remains are pure 1 over epsilon poles times uh, something which is mu independent and on the other hand mu itself appears in some finite function of epsilon. So that is very interesting. So this R bar of H has divergences which are independent of mu. And that means in particular d by d mu of uh, something like this r bar of g is finite. And this is important for setting up the theory of renormalization group. And it's also interesting that the counter term Lagrangian is independent of mu in the MS bar scheme. You can also view it as an existence proof. There exists a renormalization scheme with the property that the counter terms are independent of mu. It's a non-trivial statement. Similarly, let me add this here. Okay, let me add it as an extra comment. There exists a renormalization scheme, namely MS or MS bar, where the counter term Lagrangian is not only mu independent, but I write it down anyway, mu independent, and it has a polynomial dependence on the masses. This is also a non-trivial statement. Because in general, this uh, does not have to be. 
what quantum field theory requires is that the counter term is local. And uh, local means only that it's a polynomial in the momenta. Doesn't have to be a polynomial in the masses. And actually, if you look at concrete calculations, then often the counter terms contain logarithms of masses. It's not always polynomial, but it's an existence proof. The MS bar scheme that we have set up here explicitly has this property. The counter terms are polynomial in the momenta and masses of the given degree, and the counter terms are mu independent. So very interesting to know that uh, this scheme has that property. Then, next, let me clean the blackboard and go to the next comments. The next comment I would call mathematical consistency. So what I mean by this is um, a set of a few uh, items, uh, but I would summarize them as mathematical consistency, which means that this regularization scheme of dimensional uh, regularization is actually mathematically consistent in a certain sense. Uh, first of all, we have this, uh, what many people call sub-integration consistency. which means that if you have a subgraph H, then the calculation of this H and its divergencies and of its counter term is always identical no matter what is the bigger graph surrounding H. And we have seen this explicitly in our proof. Uh, H and R bar of H uh, depends only on H itself and not its embedding. And that is in particular important because the counter term for H can be only calculated once. Then it's put into the Lagrangian and then it's fixed for eternity. And whenever you have H a subgraph inside something bigger, then you need to take the same counter term from the Lagrangian and hope that the divergencies cancel. And of course they can only cancel if the result for that H sub diagram is always the same, no matter what you insert it into. And that is the case. And it is uh, so uh, clear from the proof in uh, our formalism, which is this alpha formalism. But actually, uh, this sub-integration consistency is even much uh, easier to see and very direct if you uh, forget about all of the formalism and just go back to momentum space where you have the normal loop integrals over momenta. Because then, uh, this is a manifest property of dimensional regularization. And the reason why it is obvious in this uh, formulation is because the loop integrals in dimensional regularization are translationally invariant. So you have an invariance under uh, k going to k plus p, where p is any other momentum. And so that means if you have some subgraph h which is inserted anywhere, then the structure of the loop integration corresponding to it uh, always looks the same in momentum space uh, up to the fact that you can assign the momentum variables in many different ways, actually in infinitely many ways, but because of this invariance against shifts in the integration momentum or also reflection, um, it is obvious that all the loop integrations are always identical, no matter how you write them down, how you assign the momenta. And that is a property I stress this uh, because it's a property which is not always true. There are regularization schemes where, for example, you do not have this shift invariance, 
uh, because you have a cutoff at some uh, moment, momentum value lambda, you cut off your integrals, and then of course your integral value is not invariant against such a shift. But in dimensional regularization, this is a fact, and therefore this is an important property. Another reason why I mention this mathematical consistency is that uh, so in some modern regularization alternatives, which are not dimensional, mm, one is often guided by something like you would do in Mathematica in computer algebra. In computer algebra systems, you type down your integral, but then the integral for the computer is a formula. It's not like in mathematics where the integral has to converge in order for you to uh, be allowed to write it down. In the computer, you write it down and then it's like a sentence. It's a, a string of letters. In a computer algebra pro, uh, program, it's a chain of symbols. And then you have defined your loop integral as a chain of symbols in computer algebra form. And then, of course, you can think of uh, implementing your regularization procedure by replacement rules. So in Mathematica, it's very natural. You take your symbolic expression, you apply onto it some replacement rules. And then you replace maybe your divergent integrals by finite integrals, and you call that a regularization, or maybe even a renormalization procedure. Then the subintegration consistency is also not obvious, and I just give you an example. So imagine you do your regularization by having a divergent integral, and the divergent integral um, has maybe k square divided by k square minus m square. Okay, this is your divergent integral. And then you define your scheme by applying replacement rules. And then you can now define your algorithm in a way, so you must define an algorithm for the computer, and then this might be replaced by something, some result. But on the other hand, uh, somebody else, and maybe you yourself in your computer, you decide to do some simplification. And so first you write this as k square minus m square over k square minus m square plus m square over k square minus m square. Then you decide, oh, I can cancel that. This is actually one. Now you have this. Now we have this expression, 1 plus another loop integration. This loop integration has actually, this part, lower degree of divergence than the original one. So now you could ask yourself, okay, uh, before doing the integration on the symbolic level, I can do this rearrangement, and I implement my renormalization by replacement rules. Then, uh, depending on what you do, uh, you might start with this, apply a replacement rule, or you might start with that and apply a replacement rule, but then you need to define two replacement rules for the one and for this. How do you guarantee that the result that you obtain by applying these different sets of replacement rules, that your result is the same? And that is guaranteed by dimensional regularization. By dimensional regularization, no matter what you do on your integrand level, uh, there is a guarantee that your integrals are always the same. They might be divergent. There are one over epsilon poles, that, but the integrals are the same. And this uh, equality is not guaranteed in uh, renormalization schemes which are implemented by mathematical replacement rules. And so then the subintegration consistency is in question. And uh, the consistency with a counterterm Lagrangian, which is fixed once and for eternity, uh, is a non-trivial statement or non-trivial question. Okay, so this is, is just, uh, I mentioned this because this is a very interesting development to replace dimensional regularization or to enhance it by such replacement rules. But uh, dimensional regularization has the advantage of obvious sub-integration consistency and other schemes might not. So, uh, to this mathematical consistency also belongs another remark, namely, uh, in our setup, in our alpha formalism, um, we had this uh, curly M's, M tilde matrices, which really define our integrand, E to the IW, and so on. And uh, 
there we define this subgraph aware variables Q. Now this is somehow uh, a little bit similar to this because before we do the actual integration and renormalization procedure, we need to fix by hand some subgraph aware choice of momenta. And now of course you might ask yourself, uh, does this um, change the result? So maybe our result uh, has a hidden dependence on what choice we make for the subgraph aware variables. But there is no such dependence because from the beginning we knew uh, that all the subgraph aware variable choices are related by an invertible matrix and our W is independent of that matrix and therefore no matter what we fix in the beginning, um, it uh, cannot change the final result. So that is also an important remark. So this is part of this mathematical consistency. So what I really always mean in general by when I say mathematical consistency in this context is you need to be able to uh, start with one initial expression and then you can apply all calculation and rules that are allowed in no matter what order. So two people can do everything they want and everybody at some point arrives at a final result. And then this final result must be unique. Cannot happen that somebody uh, does a renormalization of a graph and ends up with something. So R bar of G is uh, some result. Let's call it, um, let's call it X. Let's not call it X, let's call it small x. And person B does the same calculation, but using different uh, momentum variables, using maybe uh, shifted integration momenta uh, uh, or a different order of subgraphs and so on and so forth, and he ends up with x plus 1. That happens, you are doomed, and this is what I would call mathematically inconsistent, because then you can derive 0 is equal to 1, and that is not good. Then you have defined a scheme which is mathematically inconsistent. And such schemes also exist in the literature. Okay, people don't use them normally, but uh, they exist. And, uh, I can tell you such schemes, but uh, this is not good. And this would be mathematically inconsistent and our scheme here is mathematically consistent. So that is an important property as well. Then, Uh, let me just remark some uh, final thing, namely we have certain interesting objects In intermediate expressions, there appear certain evanescent operators. What do I mean by evanescent operators? We, first of all, we have d-dimensional objects, like, for example, a d-dimensional metric tensor. But, of course, the scheme, dimensional regularization, knows about the original four-dimensional metric tensor. And uh, we didn't discuss it here in the lecture, but for example, this four-dimensional object is definitely needed in the context of gamma 5. So that means if you set up your scheme, your Feynman diagram, and so on, then uh, before doing any renormalization uh, on the numerator, you have lots of G menus, um, gamma mu's, and many other objects. And in particular, uh, most of these G menus might be d-dimensional. But some of them might not be. There might be also four-dimensional G menus. And so uh, evanescent would be such a difference. The difference between d-dimensional and four-dimensional quantities, because that difference would be zero in the physical limit, d going to four. And the point is, and we stress this from the beginning in our formulation of the theorem, that uh, intermediate expressions need to retain the d-dimensionality of everything in the numerator. 
So in particular, if you have such a metric tensor in d dimensions, then it needs to remain d dimensional throughout the calculation, even after subdivergencies have cancelled. And so therefore, if you also happen to have this from the beginning, then this difference is always non-zero. It is treated to be a non-zero object, and this is an evanescent operator. An operator which vanishes in strictly four dimensions, but which needs to be kept non-zero in intermediate steps of the calculation. And so only at the absolutely very end, after you have constructed the fully renormalized expression for everything, then you can take the physical limit. And in this physical limit, you put epsilon to zero. And there, only there, you set B precisely equal to four, which means that these objects here uh, become zero. But in all previous expressions, you must have evanescent operators. And the uh, interesting fact is that they also might appear in conjunction with one over epsilon poles. And what we have done here, we didn't specify it completely, but it's automatically included in our discussion. These divergences are subtracted. These divergences give rise to counterterms. Such counterterms will appear in our Lagrangian. Or might, at least. So this is at least allowed. And um, so in simple theories like QCD, uh, let me just tell you so that you are not too confused, um, because of course this is a remark where you might not understand all the implications. So let me just say without explaining much, in QCD, this is not necessary. In QCD, you can write uh, the regularized, renormalized theory uh, fully d-dimensionally. So there only g mu nu in d-dimensions appears and gamma mu in d-dimensions appears. So this is completely uniform. Uh, nothing which is strictly four-dimensional appears and therefore there can also never appear such differences. Therefore, in QCD, uh, there are uh, not directly these evanescent operators. And so the counterterm Lagrangian is just uniformly written in terms of fully d-dimensional objects. But uh, such differences do not appear. However, in the electroweak standard model, where we have the gamma 5 object, and uh, gamma 5 is treated in strictly four dimensions, such objects appear. And also, uh, now uh, an outlook in supersymmetric theories. First of all, they also depend on gamma 5, but in supersymmetric theories, we use often a variant of dimensional regularization, which is called dimensional reduction. I will not explain today what that is. It is a variant of dimensional regularization, which is in a certain sense, it's a special case. In another sense, it's a generalization, but I mean, it's a variant. But uh, this proof here would also, of course, apply to dimensional reduction. Actually, of course, it's not uh, the correct thing to say, but it applies. But anyway, here, there are also such evanescent uh, objects. So, uh, at any rate, there are these distinctions between purely four-dimensional and uh, d-dimensional objects, and uh, that difference would vanish if you go to the physical limit, but it can appear that such a difference is multiplied with one over epsilon, and then it's very important to keep track of it. And uh, our procedure automatically deals with it and subtracts these divergences, and that means that in our counterterm Lagrangian uh, there are maybe evanescent operators times 1 over epsilon in the minimal subtraction scheme. And in such theories, that is relevant in practice. In QCD, it's not relevant. The end. We have done everything we wanted to do on this topic. So now the next lectures will change gears. <laughs>
Bolfour, and we'll deal with other interesting subtopics of uh, multi loop renormalization. But here we have achieved for sure a very important summit. Namely, we have proved the fundamental theorem of renormalization and dimensional regularization that graphs can be renormalized in this way. And uh, even though you might in your practical life only need the final result, it is for sure a very thrilling and interesting intellectual adventure to go through all these dirty details. And maybe the details are not only dirty, but like we have seen just a few minutes ago, they give us insight to some interesting subtleties, uh, like you see here in the comments, that can be useful also um, in uh, practical calculations and in some applications. So thanks a lot for your attention and your patience in following this proof. And uh, that is the end. Now I close the video and next time we will do something else.